Um, thanks for that introduction, and uh, it's nice to be here. I um, last spoke about malaria, I think, to this department uh, when I finished my fellowship. Uh, and I remember I was introducing some of the work that I was going to be doing for my K. So it's really exciting to think back and be able to share those findings and the work that uh, we've been doing since then. So uh, I am happy to make this really informal. Um, so I'll try to keep my eye on the chat, but uh, feel free to just interrupt me and uh, jump in with questions or comments because um, I want to make this as useful uh, to, to, to you all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, malaria elimination eradication and some of the work we've been doing to support these efforts. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'll review the epi of malaria focusing on low transmission near elimination settings and then talk about uh, some of the research I've been doing on how to find and treat infections. Um, I know you've already had some malaria lectures, but I'll, so I'll try to um, go more quickly on the background, but I think it's still um, useful because I might kind of uh, give a different perspective, um, particularly related to transmission, which is something people are thinking more and more about in, you know, in this era of COVID. So Soho mentioned um, the huge burden of disease that malaria has. And, uh, you know, we have over 200 million cases a year. Those are just the reported cases, um, almost half a million deaths. Most of these deaths are happening in children in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, particularly young children, less than five. So it's one of the top 10 leading causes of death in this age group worldwide and higher in low income countries. And it equates to about every couple of seconds a child dying of malaria. Um, so uh, the basic biology is that um, uh, the plasmodium, uh, well, malaria occurs with when the plasmodium parasite is transmitted from one human to another through the bite of the Anopheles mosquito, with the exception being plasmodium nulzi, which was recently discovered to be transmitted from monkeys to humans. So this is an illustration of a plasmodium infected red cell. And of the four human species, falciparum and vivex caused the largest burden of disease worldwide with falciparum being responsible by and large for most of the um, cases and deaths. And there's more than 400 species of Anopheles mosquitoes of which 30 to 40 commonly transmit human malaria. Anopheles gambi is the most famous. It um, transmits falciparum with great efficiency. Um, and I think what makes malaria interesting is that the different parasite species and the different mosquitoes behave differently across different geographies. And so there isn't like a one size fits all approach um, to patient care or interventions at a public health level. And you'll just have to excuse my son in the background. His teacher had COVID, so we are quarantining this week. <laughs> Um, so just to review the life cycle, um, when taking a blood meal, the infected mos uh, Anopheles mosquito, it injects a sporozoic form into uh, the human, and then the sporozoites travel to the liver where they replicate. And after about a week or 30 days, and the merozoites are released and then they evade red cells where they replicate and cause red cell rupture. The released merozoites um, then invade other red cells, uh, you know, for, um, for this, uh, for further replication. And then at some point, the merozoites transform into a sexual form called the gametocyte. And in order for transmission to occur, the, the next mosquito will come in. They need to take up both the male and female forms. Fertilization happens in the mosquito gut, and then the sporozoites make their way up to the salivary glands and then inject another person. And uh, with, with falciparum, um, you know, uh, this, this life cycle is pretty straightforward. With vivax and ovale, some parasites remain dormant in the liver um, as hypnozoites, and if they're not killed, patients can continue to relapse. So, um, oh, I just changed this, sorry. Um, so much like COVID, the clinical presentation of malaria can vary from having no or few symptoms to a nonspecific flu-like illness or severe life-threatening illness. 
And what effects where a patient falls on this spectrum has mainly to do with immunity. So after frequent exposure, people can develop a clinical immunity where they have very few infection uh, symptoms. And children and pregnant women are relatively immune naive. And so they're more likely to present with severe illness. And then other things can affect how sick you are, the species that you're infected with. I mentioned falciparum um, is the main species that causes severe disease, how quickly you present the treatment, underlying like host factors and co comorbidities. Um, to diagnose malaria, the gold standard has been microscopy. Um, so just basically doing a blood smear, staining it and looking for the presence of parasites just uh, on the slide, if you um, lice the red cells uh, in a thin smear or the presence in them with, the th with this thick smear. And so um, it's that has been um, the gold standard. Rapid diagnostics became available um, a little over a decade ago and they've really revolutionized malaria. So uh, what they do is it's like um, it's an ELISA based assay, kind of like a urine pregnancy test or like COVID tests. Um, and so you uh, take, uh, you just do a finger prick, you add your blood um, here in this hole, and then you add your buffer, it draws up the blood by capillary action. And then if you are positive, the test band will light up and if you have uh, negative, then just the control band. And so more than 300 million of these are sold uh, yearly worldwide. Um, the limitations is that they're probably similar sensitivity mic microscopy, so they don't detect the low level infections, but um, they, uh, they are just so much easier to use. Um, they, uh, you get your result back in 15 minutes and you're not having to rely on having reliable electricity and the technical skills to read a blood slide. Uh, it does detect the antigen on falciparum, the HRP2 antigen. So one issue is that um, you are, you, an antigen can persist even after you've uh, cleared your infection for several weeks. So it, you can't use it to confirm clearance of infection um, because you can get a false positive. Um, so that's another one limitation. And then molecular tests would be the most uh, sensitive option we have around, but there's challenges with turnaround time. There's um, near kind of point of care options like LAMP, loop media uh, isothermal amplification, uh, which takes less than an hour, but you still have to you know, prepare, um, extract your DNA and prepare it. Um, but molecular methods you're gonna see mainly used in a research setting again, um, or, or surveillance. So treatment is um, pretty straightforward these days since the advent of the artemisinins. Um, these were discovered um, by the Chinese uh, almost 50 years ago. Um, and uh, what we use for um, it is a combination therapy of an artemisinin with a longer acting partner drug. And um, we started using these when we developed resistance to chloroquine. Uh, for non-falciparum malaria, chloroquine still works in a lot of places, but not everywhere. So you're gonna have to review you know, your CDC um, or WHO guidelines on resistance profiles, because it's gonna vary depending on where you are. For severe malaria, we'll use an injectable artesanate followed by an oral anti-malarial, and then obviously supportive care. And I mentioned with Vivex and Novella, you have to uh, there's this liver stage and you, use, you need to use a different therapy for that. Um, primaquine, uh, which is like a seven to 14 day course of an aminoquinoline, but um, we do have a new drug, tifiniquine, which is a single dose. Um, and that's really exciting, uh, but you do have to do testing with, for G6P deficiency beforehand, because if you have this underlying red cell disorder, you can have an acute hemolysis. All right, so now I'm getting into talking about malaria elimination and eradication. So just some definitions. Control means uh, where you wanna reduce the burden of disease so that's no longer a major problem. So basically you want, don't want um, disease of death. Elimination is interrupting transmission in a defined geographical area like a region or a country. And then eradication is permanent reduction to zero worldwide. So the only human infectious disease we've eradicated is smallpox. Um, and uh, this is definitely like something I think, you know, people are thinking about more with COVID, for example, like New Zealand and Australia previously had 
tried to reach elimination, um, but I said some of those goals might, might be revisited given some of the challenges we've had. Um, so how have we been doing on elimination eradication? Well, this is, uh, you can see here that um, malaria existed almost everywhere on earth around, um, you know, around World War II. And um, only a few places didn't have malaria. So if you uh, were high, higher latitude, you know, you, you didn't have malaria. If uh, you're higher altitude, um, so Lesotho in Southern Africa uh, doesn't have malaria, it's high altitude, you can go skiing in Lesotho. Um, and then if you don't have anopheles mosquitoes, there's no malaria. So uh, the, this Buxom line, Buxom was a contemporary of Darwin, if um, he discovered this line that all the, from uh, east of this line, all the way to the, um, to the, West coast of the Americas, there are no anopheles mosquitoes, which is why there's no local malaria transmission in New Zealand or Hawaii. That might change with climate change. But anyway, almost every country had malaria. Um, with the advent of uh, chloroquine um, uh, and also um, insecticides like DDT to, to kill mosquitoes, there was a big campaign to eradicate malaria in the 1950s and 60s. And it was very successful. You know, a lot of countries eliminated malaria. But um, in the end, there was, there was the parasites developed resistance and the mosquitoes developed resistance to the insecticide. And so WHO changed their strategy from control, from elimination or eradication back to control. And, uh, but about a decade ago, um, you know, these, there's been a renewed interest in elimination. And that's partly because uh, we've made a lot of progress. This is what the map looks like today. Um, and we have new tools. I mentioned the artemisinins. I mentioned the rapid diagnostic test. We also have bed nets, which I think Paul and maybe others spoke about. Um, we have new insecticides for um, uh, in, indoor residual spraying. So with that kind of renewed hope and more funding and tools for malaria, um, you know, elimination and eradication are back on the table. And those are sort of the agreed upon goals. The the consensus seems to be that if we are smart about it and we get the support that we need, uh, malaria could be eradicated um, by 1940, 1950, um, with some lower transmission areas aiming for like 1930. Uh, uh, sorry, two, did I say 19? <laughs> I would say 2000, 2040 and 50. Um, and then lower transmission areas, like for example, the Asia Pacific is aiming for 2030. Um, so you'll notice that most of Sub-Saharan Africa is still higher burden, um, but there are parts where there is declining transmission and even pockets within these darker purple countries. Um, most of my work has been in Southern Africa uh, where the conditions are such that they have kind of reached a pre-elimination stage. And so I'll talk about uh, that work and why elimination is very different than uh, control. So um, this kind of graph you'll see in a lot of countries, but basically in the early 2000s um, in Southern Africa, well, the different interventions I mentioned are used in different places, but in Southern Africa, they've had a long history of using DDT um, for inter-residual spring. And so with that um, uh, transmission really dropped, then in about 2005, there's increasing funding from the President's Malaria Initiative and Global Fund for all these new tools like diagnostics, drugs, bed nets, and then malaria really dropped. But the challenge is that for the last decade, um, or, you know, it's they've just maintained these really low levels of transmission. And uh, you even see you know, outbreaks um, here, here and there, uh, because if you don't completely get rid of malaria, it's just going to resurge if the conditions are right. So how do you get from uh, high to low um, seems, uh, pretty straightforward because a lot of countries have done it, but how you get from low to no is not clear. So why is um, malaria elimination so difficult? Well, first, many infections are asymptomatic or associated with minimal symptoms, and so they don't present for care. Even if they do present for care, they may not be detected due to the um, limitation uh, the detection limits of these rapid diagnostics and microscopy, like I mentioned. So we had we did this study in Eswatini, former Swaziland, um, and found that in people presenting with fever, 
um, the sensitivity of rapid diagnostic tests was 50%. Um, and when we use PCR, you know, we found that a lot, a lot more infection. And there, this has been shown in a few other lower transmission settings too. Um, and then uh, without treatment, a low level infection will persist for months to years. And that, that infection that's in the bloodstream um, will be a reservoir for persistent transmission. Um, so that's, that's, that's one challenge. Another is that as transmission declines, um, it becomes more focal. And so uh, instead of a whole district having malaria, um, you'll find pockets of transmission in particular neighborhoods or households, and it might be associated with poor housing or living near a mosquito breeding site. Um, you also have certain um, behaviors or habits that make you more at risk for malaria. So maybe you are a forest worker and you go into the forest a lot. And in, the, in these parts of, for example, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of trans, uh, forest uh, mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Or maybe you're moving, you're um, moving for work. And so you go to a higher transmission area and then you come back and then you, you bring it back. So trying to understand like where are these geographical hotspots and who are the high risk individuals is really key uh, for um, malaria elimination. And to date, you know, standard interventions don't really target. There's the, you sort of aim for, oh, above 80% um, coverage of bed nets. You aim for, you know, a certain proportion of people presenting at health facility all getting tested or getting treatment if they need to. But um, elimination really requires kind of a more targeted and tailored approach. So I'm going to get into some of the research that we've been doing. Um, first is, uh, I mentioned um, the focus of my uh, K after my uh, ID fellowship at UCSF, which was focused on what we call reactive case detection. Uh, I'll talk about some of the studies we've been doing to evaluate um, more sensitive rapid diagnostic tests. And then uh, I'll end with a trial that we conducted in Namibia, a cluster randomized control trial where we uh, tried out something new, um, just a uh, basically presumptive treatment or mass drug administration targeted to high-risk areas. Before I kind of go into the research bit, I, I can just pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions or comments. Uh, and if you don't, it's fine. <laughs> All right, I'll keep going. Um, so I'll first talk about reactive case detection. Um, uh, so this work is taking place, took place in Eswatini, um, former Swaziland. Um, the, the king renamed the country uh, on his 50th birthday. Um, so it, this is a small landlocked country. Um, they've achieved really low levels of transmission. About 30% of the population is at risk, mainly on the Eastern side. And you can see that with this um, standard interventions, they malaria dropped to very low levels, but it's kind of plateaued for the last few years. Uh, we did a cross-sectional survey in um, uh, before we started this work and found confirmed that there was a very low prevalence of PCR. Um, I mean, incidence we knew was already low, but sometimes people will question whether or not that uh, surveillance data uh, are reliable. And so, a lot of times just going on doing a cross-sectional survey is, is, a, is a kind of gold standard to assess your level of transmission. And I'll just mention that we did pooled PCR. This was uh, one of my fellowship projects um, because we anticipated, well, first of all, it helps you save resources, um, but also uh, we anticipated a very low prevalence because it's a low transmission setting. And so, um, uh, it's you sort of need a larger sample size to be able to measure something. So it, it, pooling made sense in a setting where you have a lot of samples um, that you're trying to process and you don't expect you know, that many to be positive because if you have a high prevalence of infection then many of your pools will be positive and there's uh, you know, no point in pooling. Michelle, sorry, can yeah. I ask a question about uh -huh. that? I'm yeah. How uh, some of those numbers you just presented uh, compare to its neighbors? Uh, oh, sure. That's a good question. So uh, in South Africa, um, you'll probably find similar numbers. The challenge really is Mozambique, um, where there's a lot more malaria. So if you just go across the border, um, 
you're going to have a prevalence um, by microscopy, uh, probably somewhere, depending on where you are in Mozambique, somewhere from probably 20 to 50 or 60% will be positive. It's just really remarkable that there are so many people just walking around with parasites in their blood. So um, you would yeah. then say that it's probably related to like policy more than geography. Uh, is that right? Saying the differences between Swaziland and Mozambique? Some of it, yeah, it has to do with socioeconomic factors for sure. Um, but it also, uh, you know, this area is, is much higher altitude uh, than this area. So if you were to go to Swaziland, you would see that, um, well, malaria is mainly in a lower altitude area, but uh, it's quite mountainous. Um, but it has to do with the local epidemiological factors. So I think there's epidemiological factors which make it so that there's less transmission in Swaziland, but there's also just a stronger health infrastructure. So people are getting access to interventions, both public health interventions and um, you know, case management when they become ill. Great, thanks. Yeah, and a lot of people will argue that, well, we could get to elimination eradication just with socioeconomic development. But there's been, you know, and I don't have time to go into this, but there are many stories of countries that have eliminated malaria when they were very poor. Um, and so it, a lot behind this is that there are tools and there are approaches that we can use to accelerate you know, elimination. I mean, certainly if everyone lives in homes that have screens and air conditioning and um, they can get good health care, malaria will go away for sure. Um, but we have ways to kind of accelerate um, that, 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 um, that uh, path there. Mm -hmm. So, um, reactive case detection, which is sort of like uh, active case finding, uh, similar to what we do for TB in the United States, um, or what we, we tried to do with COVID. Um, you find a case in the health facility, and then you go to the home and the neighborhood to look for additional infections. And this is uh, the, was the main malaria elimination strategy in Eswatini uh, when I started doing this work in 2009. Uh, and it's practiced in many parts of the world. Um, but it's mainly based on microscopy and rapid diagnostic tests. And so we uh, thought there was probably going to be some limitations of this. So we just uh, leveraged this program that was already existing and evaluated um, rapid diagnostic tests compared to uh, you know, more sensitive molecular based method. And we looked at um, how uh, this the, the current method compared in terms of yield to identify infections and also hotspots. And we define hotspots as an event where you found at least one additional infection in that they used to use a 500 meter radius. Um, and then we also uh, sought to look at areas for improved efficiencies to maximize yield and efficiency because it is very resource intensive. You basically have an on-call team that is always responding to cases. Um, we also utilize some of the samples to do some genotyping work to try and understand, uh, uh, well, just kind of measure transmission, um, but also uh, see what would, what's the contribution of different types of infections to transmission, like asymptomatic infections or imported versus local infections. So these are just some images in the field. They would do the rapid testing and then we would additionally get a dried blood spot to do um, PCR or LAMP on that afterwards. And we also had pre-downloaded uh, um, Google map images where they could uh, beforehand see sort of how many households were in that radius. And then the supervisors could also use this to, um, for their uh, monitoring of how thorough the team was. Uh, and I would just add that um, when they launched this program, the program uh, developed a rapid reporting system, which they didn't have before. Um, a lot of uh, countries have these for different reasons. China, for example, developed a rapid reporting system uh, due to SARS, um, uh, the, the initial SARS. Um, and then they leveraged that system and added on a, huge, a bunch of other mandatory reportable diseases. So in Swaziland's case, or Eswatini, they developed this when they were trying to go for elimination. And then they added on 20-some uh, other mandatory reportable illnesses. And it's a toll-free number that you call 
so that you can get data really rapidly um, and respond quickly. Uh, so reactive case detection depends on you know, good reporting um, at health facilities. So over the three years that we did this study, there were a little over a thousand cases reported. I want, this is a bit detailed, but I'll just highlight the pieces. This led to almost 400 reactive case detection events in which over 12,000 were screened. We focused the analysis on people who resided within 500 meters, um, and we compared the LAMP and the RDT results. And um, RDT positivity rate is really low, less than 1%. So you can see this is a really um, intensive uh, activity. Um, and then uh, LAMP detected more infections, um, but still low level. But when you compare the two, um, RDT missed two thirds of the infections. And if you looked at the analysis from a hotspot level, RDT missed 40% of the hotspots. So it didn't perform great for infections or hotspots. We tried actually to implement the LAMP in real time, but it just operationally, it was too challenging to do. Um, our our, uh, th this is, um, I'll get to the operations bin a little bit, but this uh, just shows a map of all the um, RDT positive cases and the crossbar is the number that were found. And then the circle represents like the number of LAMP detectable infections. So you can see that um, LAMP detected more uh, uh, infections and hotspots than RDT. And also found some areas where you wouldn't, you know, by RDT, you wouldn't even think there was any transmission going on. So we also confirmed that there was household clustering. Um, so this is uh, on the x-axis, your distance from the index household, and this is the prevalence of infection. So you had a higher risk of being infected if you lived in the same household. And then there was a decay or dose-dependent relationship the farther away you were from the index case. This graph just shows the proportion of infections relative to how close you are to the index case. So even though you have a higher risk if you live in the same household, um, the largest, you know, you still find a lot of infections outside of the index case household, so in neighboring households. So just sort of emphasizing that if you just limited the um, screening to the household, you, you would still be missing out on a lot in neighboring households. Um, Oh, I don't have those slides, but we looked at also a lot, a lot of other ways that you could sort of optimize efficiencies on how you do reactive case detection. We found that actually, if you limited your screening um, to 200 meters, you would still find like almost 80% of the infections uh, and that you would save a lot of time and money. Um, so, you know, those, those, those things, are, are relevant because you only have um, you know, limited resources to do this work. Another important question is like, maybe you find more infections, but maybe that finding of infections and treating them doesn't actually decrease transmission. Um, and so we didn't compare reactive case detection or RACD to no reactive case detection, but we did do some genotyping work to try and better understand you know, what exactly is going on and whether or not this strategy could decrease transmission, um, de you know, depending on what diagnostic you used or you know, how sensitive your intervention was. So we um, genotyped 26 neutral microsatellites. We had about 800 samples from symptomatic and asymptomatic people over three years. And this was work in collaboration with um, folks at University of Notre Dame, John Huber, uh, who's been doing this work, and Alex Perkins. So they had a transmission model to generate these networks, which are shown here. And this model takes into account genetic relatedness, time, travel history, um, and allows for genotyping error and genetic bottlenecks um, at each transmission event. And you can see here, each dot represents a case. And so the red is imported, the blue is local cases. And um, the R, I think people are now familiar with what an R naught means. It's, um, it's sort of a measure of transmission. Um, and uh, you can see here that most of these infections um, were uh, not associated with, with additional chains. Um, but there were, you know, both imported and local cases you know, were associated with, were, were you know, can linked with other infections. Um, here you can see that uh, the number of offspring that 
you would have um, for the type of infection. So gray is all infections, the orange is imported cases, and then blue is local cases. And so you can see most cases, almost 80% almost of all infections, they had no offspring. So they were just isolated events. Um, and then, uh, you know, you, some might have up to four, or maybe even six offspring. Uh, the local cases seem to have more offspring than the, than the imported, but they're still uh, pr pretty similar. And then here's that same data with um, uh, RC, that's sort of, oh, C is sort of under control measures, the number of offspring you have. And then on the um, X axis, you have sort of the type of infection. So we have, those that traveled imported on the left side and then those that did not travel on the right, and then whether or not they were symptomatic or asymptomatic. So you can see that RC was higher for the asymptomatic cases, whether or not they were imported and local. And that would make sense, like I mentioned to you, because if you have asymptomatic infection and it goes untreated, your infection persists. So that chronicity is seems to be um, a risk factor for that person having more um, offspring. So sort of brings to the point that finding asymptomatic infections is important for reducing transmission. Um, I got a question from how, uh, and sorry if I'm not saying your name right, uh, Doviatum. Um, how do you use digital how, uh, pr uh, based approaches in malaria elimination programs in Africa? So, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways that, that you can use digital health. Um, We've used it in reactive case detection in the way that I showed you. Um, some places they're using it for case reporting. Um, here in Swaziland, they weren't. I mentioned it's a, it's a paper form and then they, uh, they call a toll-free hotline. Um, people are using it to, um, uh, to uh, kind of do surveillance um, and then uh, monitor kind of the response to, to that those cases, either with reactive case detection or what I'm gonna to get to later, reactive local mass drug administration. People use it to monitor their like bed net campaigns or their indoor residual spraying, the coverage that they're getting. Um, it's being used for febrile case management. I don't know if some of the prior speakers spoke to that, but uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot out there on how, uh, on digital solutions uh, for malaria elimination and eradication. So to conclude, I don't know if that answers your question or if you um, had other. Yeah, okay. Um, so we concluded that infections do cluster around index cases. We found that rapid diagnostic tests are insufficiently sensitive to detect infections in hotspots. And we showed that asymptomatic infections do have higher transmission potential than symptomatic cases. And we concluded that more sensitive diagnostics are needed. So in 2017, um, uh, a new rapid diagnostic was developed and we, we, we did some studies to evaluate it. So we did this in Namibia, which is a similar low transmission setting. We had also shown here that um, they, a rapid diagnostic test detect a small proportion of the infections that you would detect by LAMP or PCR. Um, this rapid diagnostic test uh, targets the same protein, the HRP2 antigen, and um, it was being promoted uh, 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 for use based on some preliminary data from the lab and also from higher transmission settings. They found that um, there was, it was 10 times more sensitive to detect HRP2 antigen. So whereas normally an RDT would detect 800 picograms per ml, this one would detect 80. Um, and people sort of assume that there is a correlation between parasite density and HRP2. I'd say that's generally the case, um, but it depends on where you are in that distribution of parasite density. Uh, and in, in Uganda here in a higher transmission setting, they showed that it, it increased the sensitivity um, compared to the, it had a higher sensitivity compared to the standard rapid diagnostic test. So we did this in, um, in Namibia, a low transmission setting. We did a, uh, we leveraged a trial we were doing, and we had a big cross-sectional survey of over 4,000 people. We found that 2% were positive by rapid diagnostic tests and 2.4, and just a little bit more by the, the ultra-sensitive or the URDT. Um, and so you can see here that using PCR as gold standard, um, the sensitivity was not that much greater. And 
So that was disappointing. Now, why was that? Well, it was just, we just had very low level infection. So the, the mean uh, density was like 3.1 parasites per microliter. And I mentioned RDT detects about like 100 parasites per microliter or above. And when you're talking about a sick patient that you might see in the hospital, they will have an infection that's several thousand or tens, hundreds of thousand parasites per microliter. So we just had, these were generally asymptomatic people because it was a cross-sectional survey. So we just had very low levels of infection. You can see as, trans, as parasite density go out, goes up, URDT may be detected a little bit more. Um, and this is, uh, specificity was fine. And positive predictive value, even though specificity was high, positive predictive value was low because the prevalence was low. Um, and why was this? Well, it, it's kind of an, an interesting thing that we've found over time, but basically it seems like lower transmission settings, um, the prevalent infections are lower density. So this is a meta-analysis from over 70 studies. Um, and you can see here on the x-axis was the PCR prevalence of those in each, um, each uh, row in this analysis would be a, a site. And then here is the proportion of infections that were detected by microscopy. So you can see that when transmission is lower, a lower proportion of infections are detected by microscopy. And the reasons for this are not really clear, but it's been shown over and over again. One thinking is that in a lower transmission setting, you have less genetic diversity. And so maybe people are exposed to those strains and then they are able to control them better. That's one idea. It's also possible that um, you have a lower risk of reinfection in a lower transmission setting. And so just because if you don't get treated, those infections persist, a higher proportion of infections that you're testing in that sort of slice in time and those people are low density. Um, but it's, it's an interesting phenomenon and it has a lot of relevance to how we uh, look for infections and how we treat them. We then tried to see if maybe the diet rapid test could be used to detect hotspots. And so we had a lot of data from this setting. We had, um, we had PCR data, we had HRP2 ELISA, like a highly sensitive HRP2 assay. We also had incidents from this setting. And so we use these three measures to create like a composite gold standard to see like maybe in a hotspot, like in a village, if you used RDT or URDT and you found at least like one or two positives, you could call that area hotspot. Um, maybe that would still be useful. You wouldn't find all the infections, but you could still use it to kind of, to find a hotspot. So this is sort of the distribution of where uh, each dot is at, like a village in Namibia and where they fell um, in terms of uh, their, their, the different results uh, for, for the measures that went into the gold standard. And so we did find generally that this uh, URDT was more sensitive than RDT to find hotspots based on this um, definition that we use, 68% versus 52%. And I, I don't have time to go into a lot of the details, but we tried to kind of um, internally validate this with a different approach uh, and uh, found a similar result. Um, I think the main, the takeaway from this, from my perspective is that maybe that URDT, the ultrasensitive URDT may not be useful to detect more infections, but perhaps it could be used from a more surveillance um, approach to find a hotspot. Um, maybe, maybe you're not sure if this area is a hotspot or not, but you go out with your URDT and at least it gives you a rapid result. And if you, you would find uh, more infections with the URDT versus the RDT, so it could be useful uh, from, a, for, from a surveillance perspective. So we conclude, uh, yeah, basically that, um, and that, uh, but that for this sort of test and treat approach, um, it, it may not be useful, but maybe you could use it to you know, treat a whole hotspot. Uh, anyway, we, 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 there are others that are working on sort of different diagnostics to detect hotspots, whether those are like serological based or um, antigen based. Um, but we sort of uh, took it another approach to try and look at whether or not just um, not using a diagnostic at all um, would just presumptive treatment of high risk areas be helpful. So we conducted this trial in Namibia where we wanted to compare reactive case detection to basically presumptive treatment in these hotspots. 
So we utilized um, the same infrastructure of reactive case detection. So basically to treat these hotspots of transmission, you wanna target the human and you wanna target the mosquito. For the human, their standard intervention is reactive case detection for mosquito. There's no targeted intervention. They generally just do spraying before the season or distribute bed nets. And so we wanted to compare this to just treating people, uh, reactive focal mass drug administration, not even doing testing um, with a drug that is safe um, and effective. Uh, and then we also wanted to look at another kind of focal intervention called reactive vector control, or some might call it reactive IRS. And um, there are some new insecticides available. Uh, there's the insecticide we use is called um, Ectelic. And the rationale for using this, and we targeted the seven households around the index case, which is about 500 meters, is that um, this could overcome some of the incomplete coverage of spraying that happens before the season. And then using an insecticide of a different chemical class could slow the development of insecticide resistance. Also, this insecticide is very expensive. So in most settings, they wouldn't be able to use it you know, throughout the district. Um, you want to use it in a targeted way just because it, it costs more. So we use this two by two factorial design, which is basically like uh, enables you to evaluate interventions independently and in combination. So basically you, you randomize your villages to one, one of these four boxes, RACD only, RFMD only, or plus or minus reactive vector control. And you can compare um, you know, reactive focal mass drug administration to reactive case detection, then you can compare reactive vector control to no reactive vector control. And then just looking at the purple and white boxes, you can compare the combination intervention to just reactive case detection only. So it's kind of like being able to do three trials in one. Um, uh, so our primary outcome was incidence of local cases. We also looked at prevalence in an endline survey and we did an intention to treat analysis. Um, this took place in 2017. This was a low transmission area, less than 15 per 1,000 was the annual per, um, incidence. When we started, we actually meant to start the trial in 2016, but there was an outbreak that year where like the incidence was double than what it was in prior years. And we just weren't, um, we didn't really have enough team to, to cover the cases. So we, we started all over again in 2017 and re-randomized the, 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 um, the, the, we use census enumeration areas as our unit of randomization. Um, this is just an image of the, 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 um, the, the, the clusters. And so a team would go out and do test and treat or they would give drug and then another team would follow and either spray or not spray. And we had a local processing lab to process some of the samples. Um, and then we would send them down to um, the capital when wind took with our collaborator, the University of Namibia. Um, to do um, more studies. So we had 56 clusters. Um, ultimately, it was about 342 events were conducted. Almost um, uh, 4,000 people received uh, the reactive case detection. Over 4,000 received reactive focal mass drug administration. So almost over 8,000 people received the drug-based intervention. And then we targeted about 1,000 households with this for intervention. Our coverage was good. Um, one thing we found later on is that uh, when you did the randomization, you know, you normally try to do your randomization so that your clusters are, are similar. Um, we decided not to use the 2016 data because we thought it was an anomalous year. Um, but after we did the study, we found that the all the intervention clusters actually had a higher incidence in 2016 than the control clusters. So we uh, looked, we, 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 we did an analysis to control for that in our, in our main analysis. So this is the table that shows the main outcome of incidence. It's very busy, I'll walk you through. But basically each row represents the comparison. So this is the drug-based intervention. This is the, um, the, the mosquito targeting intervention. This is the combination. And this is the incidence. So you can see generally the incidence and intervention is on the, uh, the, 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 the bottom and controls on the top. So the intervention uh, arms all had lower incidence, but there was, uh, the strength of evidence is weak if you just compared incidents. And then when in our model where we calculated the incident rate ratio, there was a lower IRR um, in the intervention clusters, but we didn't reach statistical significance uh, or um, you know, the, the strength of the, the evidence was, was weak. But when we adjusted for that 20, that baseline 2016 incidents, 
we were able to see that um, the each of the interventions, the drug and the mosquito-based intervention, decreased incidence by 50%. And then the combination, here you see like an additive effect where it decreased the incidence by 20, almost, uh, almost 75%. Um, and it made sense that there was this sort of um, add, additive effect of the two interventions. So that was really exciting. Um, you know, no other interventions have shown effect sizes that high. If you look at even bed nets or um, some of the vaccines that are, that are available. Uh, we looked at a secondary outcome of prevalence at the end, and we found a similar trends. Um, and of note, there was a there was evidence of a synergistic um, interaction between the two interventions for, for the outcome of, pre of prevalence. And you can see here, particularly large reduction in prevalence, uh, adjusted prevalence ratio of 0.16. The intervention was safe. We didn't really have any serious adverse events. Adherence was really high, which was surprising. Um, and I think some of that was because they had just experienced the outbreak last year. But also, if you if if you remember our design, we were only targeting uh, people who lived in the same household as someone who recently got malaria or a neighbor of someone who recently got malaria. So there's a lot of concern about you know acceptability of a presumptive treatment intervention and adherence, but. Uh, we had really high acceptability um, and adherence. And we think it's because there was a per, this perceived um, sense of risk uh, if you were in those high risk pockets. Um, we had very few refusals um, and we actually did some focus group discussions and that's that's been published recently. Um, and we did find that malaria risk was something that drove people to uh, accept the intervention. The other was uh, being able to just Get it at home, like having the intervention brought to them, um, that they were free, and also that people, the staff, were professional and respectful. So, in summary, all the interventions, especially the combination, decreased incidence and prevalence, and we also saw that it decreased zero prevalence. I don't, I'm not showing that data here. All the interventions were safe and acceptable, leading to high coverage and adherence, and the interventions were oh, cost effective. I didn't go into that analysis, but. Um, we wanted to include this in order for the findings to have policy relevance. You, know, you really need to do economic analyses because at the end, end of the day, the program only has so much budget uh, to use. And so we did find that the interventions were cost effective. Um, they, uh, they, and um, particularly for um, RFMDA, because RFMDA was just, you're comparing it to the current standard. And so it, it only costs, you're using the same team. So it's only, it only costs a little bit more for whatever new interventions you're using, like the drug or, um, you know, having nurses to do pharmacovigilance. So it's only a hundred dollars um, per case averted. And then the combination intervention and the spray intervention was cost effective, but it did cost more though. In our paper, we talk about how you could have some cost savings, or um, if you, let's say the spray team went out with the drug-based team, because we actually had a separate spray team, or if the insecticide costs, uh, if you could negotiate a lower um, uh, cost of those, and uh, you know that, that would also make the intervention more affordable. So in summary, I, I mentioned this, so, and the interventions are cost-effective. So uh, limitations, we, it was a short study, just one year, we had that imbalance in baseline incidence, but um, it was uh, an important trial because it was the first to evaluate these re reactive focal interventions. It was the first to evaluate the um, effect of these interventions independently and in combination. And we saw really high magnitude in the effect. Um, and we addressed practical concerns like acceptability and cost. So we conclude that mass drug administration or and vector control implemented in a reactive focal fashion, and particularly in combination, should be considered to accelerate achievement um, of malaria elimination. So um, I'm almost done. Basically, in summary, to eliminate, eliminate and eradicate malaria, it's critical to know how to find and treat infections. Reactive case detection with standard diagnostics is unlikely to reduce transmission, and URDT provide a marginal benefit compared to RDT, though perhaps it can be used for surveillance. In the absence of ultra-sensitive rapid diagnostic tests, presumptive treatment, and or vector control should be considered for transmission reduction. And moving forward, um, 
I didn't mention this, but we did a similar trial in Swaziland and Eswatini where we saw a trend towards an effect, but we didn't reach statistical significance. And we think this had to do with underpowering issues, just not enough clusters for that effect uh, size that we had um, hypothesized. Also, Swaziland is a different setting. There's a lot of imported malaria I, men I mentioned from Mozambique. This setting in Namibia didn't have a lot of imported malaria. So it could be that in um, you know, the combination of us not having enough clusters and there being imported malaria, we weren't able to show uh, that the intervention was effective. And so we're exploring kind of alternative approaches, maybe using different measures like serological measures, which give you a larger window, window of exposure to measure. Um, I'm working with Jade Benjamin Chung, who is an epidemiologist at Stanford, um, to uh, look at, to kind of tease out the direct or indirect effects of these interventions. Um, and also, perhaps we can use some molecular tools. I mentioned that some of this genotyping work can help you can be sort of a help you measure uh, transmission like an R naught. Um, we have a few other MDA trials going on. Um, some uh, the Senegal one I'm a PI on. The other ones I'm a co I on. But uh, we have one in Thailand which is targeting both falciparum and vivax. In Senegal, we're doing a trial that compares mass drug administration to in all ages to just seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which is just targeted toward children. And in Namibia, Jenny Smith and our group is lead, has led a, work, a project where she's looked at targeting high-risk groups like um, migrant workers and cattle herders. Um, some new directions that I'm going in if, if, for anybody who's potentially interested in getting more involved. Um, we have some new work uh, uh, that's looking at new drug regimens for Vivax. Um, and this is in Latin America. We have a project going on in Colombia and hopefully we'll have a project going on in Peru. I'm preparing that grant right now. And then from a pediatric perspective, I know I haven't mentioned much about kids, but um, I've been really interested in whether these low level chronic infections truly are asymptomatic or not. Um, there's more and more evidence to suggest, suggest that they're not, that they are associated with anemia, poor growth, um, they affect school attendance and learning um, in terms of having cognitive effects, and that uh, they may also alter your immunological responses um, to other infections. So in Uganda, for example, in an area that, that was previously high transmission, Tororo, at, when malaria went down, they also found that non-malarial infections went down too. Um, so it's not really clear um, why that is, um, but you know, I, I have some hypotheses uh, and I've designed a trial which uh, looks like it will be funded. Um, it, that's gonna be based in Tanzania where we're basically gonna follow children that have low level infections for a couple of years and then we'll randomize some to getting treatment versus not. And I'm gonna be looking at not malarial outcomes because we'll be treating malaria, but looking at sort of these more subtle measures of chronic illness, like all cause, like, um, you know, all cause sick visits, fever episodes uh, due to, you know, any infection, anemia, growth um, and learning. So if you're interested in any of this work, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, these projects take huge collaborations and groups and so many people to do in Namibia. We've We've had a great partnership with the University of Namibia, Davis Mubengegwe there, and the Ministry of Health with Dr. Um, Usiku. Uh, we've, uh, at London School, Imo Kleinschmidt led the work on um, with this, the indoor residual spraying with Ectelic. Lindsay Wula has led the serology work. I was previously at UT Southwestern, um, and I had a team there, uh, Brooke, and that I mean, Brooke Whittemore, Paolo Manrico, pa Patrick McCreesh that contributed a lot. And the funding for this was Novartis um, Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and also a grant I had at UT Southwestern. For the Eswatini work, we've had a great partnership with the Ministry of Health there and also the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Simon Kunene, who um, has unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, was a really huge proponent of this work and a really great partner. Um, and uh, I mentioned the um, genotyping and transmission um, modeling work we've been doing with uh, Notre Dame. And then Jade Benjamin Chung at Berkeley, she's doing some of the analysis on the spillover effects. And this was funded through NIH, the Gates Foundation, and also uh, the Horchow Family Fund at UT Southwestern. So that's all I have. Um, thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, yeah, the floor is open for questions. Feel free to uh, take yourself off mute and ask the question directly, or you can go ahead and put it in the chat too. I'll start with uh, one question. So, I mean, your research is very compelling uh, that these effects do seem real and sustained. Um, uh, at what point, like, what do you think it's going to take to move from that space to it's, it, it works, you know, and, and moving it more into a policy realm? Yeah, so um, this reactive focal mass drug administration reactive spraying is not recommended right now. Um, and a lot of countries, some countries will move forward without sort of a WHO recommendation. Some will, would want to prefer to have a WHO recommendation. And a lot of times the funding come, it will only come if there is a WHO recommendation because like Global Fund or PMI or some, some other funder will only support something that is kind of a rec recommendation. Um, right now, uh, last week or the week before, um, the Global Malaria Program did meet and they're doing a review of um, reactive focal mass drug administration and reactive IRS. I don't know if there's going to be enough data there for them to create a policy recommendation. I mean, there is, MDA is recommended and there are some guidelines on how to do it. But as with a lot of guidelines, it, it, it depends on your context. It depends on a lot of factors. And so I think that um, you could argue that it's already approved under current policies. It's just like, there's so many nuances to how you do it and when you do it and what drug do you do and how many rounds do you do and what kind of coverage should you get in. Um, and so what we tried to do was design an approach that made sense in this setting. And I would say that both interventions would be great if you have the resources to do it. If not, or if one is not you know, commonly, is acceptable in a setting, maybe they don't want to do IRS in certain settings. Um, maybe do the drug-based approach. Um, I mean, what they're, a lot of programs are already doing now, reactive case detection, they already have the existing infrastructure to do it. So it's just sort of changing it to a different approach. Um, it, it, it takes a lot for a program to change a policy. And right now um, for this reactive focal mass drug administration, I'm only aware of, um, there's five studies um, and they're all very different. And I mentioned the other study in Swaziland we had where we did not, were not able to show an effect. So I, I'm not sure what will come of that WHO meeting. I, I would hope that it's not sort of like a yes or no, you should do it or not, but that, it, that, that these are the pros of doing it and these might be the cons. And in this setting, it might more, make more sense than others. And that programs would have the support um, to, to do it, both funding and, um, guidance and, you know, a, a partner to sort of design the right intervention. Because sometimes it's for something that's new and that they haven't done before, um, having that guidance, I think, um, with the funding uh, could, 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 make, could make this sort of more reality that programs are actually doing. The other thing I would just add is that it, it, there's going to be more interventions available. You know, we have a lot of vaccines in the pipeline. It may be that it's vaccines. It may be that it's um, some other vector control intervention. And I think what we just wanted to show here is this in a low transmission setting where you have a good surveillance system and you're picking up index cases and you know that uh, asymptomatic and initial infections cluster around those cases and you can use that as a useful kind of um, trigger that that you should be implement doing something more than just test and treat, which is not finding a lot of infections. And that what that intervention should be, might be different in different contexts. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, multi-pronged approach is probably mm -hmm. the way going forward. 2030 seems around the corner. <laughs> so that's why <what> <laughs> yeah. crazy as that sounds. Um, all right. Well, thank you again. Really appreciate your time and sharing. Uh, I imagine it's all right for folks to reach out to you if they have questions offline. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to people. And um, I, I haven't really met that many 
people yet since I came back to UCSF, but uh, I'll be starting back on service soon. I have a couple of weeks in late October. So uh, if you see me, um, and we can chat more in person too, or just reach out by email. That's great. All right. Thank you. Um, and, and just a reminder, thanks, Tiffany, for putting in the chat, but uh, it'd be great if everyone can fill out evaluations too. Thank you. Thank you.